Excellent. Uh, please uh, start, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you, um, Isaac. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll be discussing the evolution of income or wealth distribution with higher order autoregressive processes. And uh, I'm Sam, and um, I work with Pritika. Okay. And yeah, as Isaac mentioned, our supervisors were Jonathan and uh, Ravi. So to introduce what we'll be dis discussing, um, our main question is, so how does intergenerational mobility affect uh, inequality? Uh, in, in particular, we're talking about in economic mobility and economic uh, inequality. And we shall be investigating this using autoregressive process models. And another interesting question is the reverse. So if you had a measure of inequality, how would you then estimate mobility between generations? However, we'll be um, investigating the first, first one. So how does mobility um, affect inequality? And just to illustrate what mobility means, so I'm sure many of you have heard of this phrase, so from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. So essentially you can have um, like someone was poor and then their children like made it in the economy say and became rich but then their children again went down and became poor again so uh, the old term for this is shirt sleeves um so that would be high mo mobility and then i was trying to find a quote for the reverse of this but i couldn't really find one with shirt sleeves anyway so i just made one up so if you say shirt sleeves stay a shirt sleeve over many many generations so this would be like low mobility. So, you know, those who are poor stay poor for many generations, or you could look at the reverse of rich stay rich for many generations, etc. Okay, so to introduce, um, we let XT be the log of income or wealth as well, but for our purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on income. And we let epsilon. Uh, cultural and, and or genetic endowment of generation at generation T. And this, and we assume this following model, which has uh, some micro or economic foundations, uh, which was from Solon, which he summarizes in his paper in 18. And this was adapted from an earlier paper in 1979 by Becker and Tomes. And um, so the model is, is essentially, um, so I'll, I'll just read it. So it's xt equals alpha plus beta xt minus one plus epsilon t and epsilon t um, equals theta epsilon t minus one plus eta. So this alpha uh, part is the, the trend in average incomes across the entire population. And this beta is the relationship between generations of income. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, this silent T, which is serially correlated, is a measure of the some other factor that's not income. So you could say cultural or genetic endowment. So um, like how does parents genes, I guess, pass or how does their involvement pass to the next generation, you could say. And this eta t is just a random noise from a normal distribution with zero, mean zero and variant sigma squared. Um, and we notice this epsilon t is an AR1 process. And if we zero, then xt itself would be an uh, AR1 process. Okay. Um, so this model, if you just substitute for epsilon t, you can rearrange <clears throat> as so and get express that same model as a AR2 process. So you have this uh, XT minus two, so the income of grandparents as well, or log of income of grandparents. And uh, what's interesting about this is that you would expect beta and theta to be greater than zero. So pos essentially positive relationship between income of parents and children and some sort of cultural or genetic factor between parents and children, you'd expect both, both of those to be positive, uh, which then implies 
the coefficient of the grandparents is negative. So the minus beta theta would then be negative. So would you then think that this would imply a negative relationship between children's and grandparents' income? Um, expect that, but we're going to come back to this point um, later on. Okay. <clears throat> so now just some general results of um, AR2 process. Sorry. Um, so AR2 process. So this is the up here. Um, hopefully you can see the mouse. Um, so, and in, in particular, we want to look at when it's stationary. So when it, the, uh, roughly when the mean and variance um, are independent. And this happens for these conditions on beta, uh, on beta one and beta two, um, which can be represented as within this triangle in the beta one, beta two space. <clears throat> and so under this stationary condition, the mean um, as this, the variance as this, and the autocorrelation or rho one as this formula. Um, and also you have that uh, xt become, follows a in stationarity is a normal distribution with the mean mu and the variance uh, gamma naught, and that implies that um, so that log of income is normal. So that implies income is log normal under this model. <clears throat> um, so now. Uh, we're introduced two quantities, this intergenerational income elasticity and variance of logs. So first assume an AR1 process as follows. And then given this process, an AR1 process, you can estimate beta, uh, beta hat, use at the OLS ordinary least squares estimator of beta, beta hat is the, um, is the autocorrelation of XT. However, Assuming instead that the model was actually the original Solon model introduced, then um, setting, so from the previous slide here, we have an AR2 with beta one as beta plus beta and beta two as um, minus beta theta. So substituting that in here, so beta one, beta plus theta and beta two as minus beta theta, we get exactly this which was the autocorrelation of um, an AR2. And this we call the intergenerational income elasticity. And also if we substitute beta one as beta plus theta and beta two as minus beta theta into the variance um, of the AR1, AR2 um, of the solar model, we get this, which is the variance of logs. And um, the variance of logs is an inequality measure and we notice in both these formulas the symmetry of beta and theta so replacing beta and theta um, you get the same formula okay um, so uh, now say you say we had from data we inferred that it was an ar1 process so say you had the data's xt and xt minus one then you could estimate beta hat and gamma not hat exactly. But then say you thought it was actually the solar model, then you have these representations of beta, beta hat in terms of beta and theta and gamma not in terms of beta and theta. Um, and then you could then sort, so you have two equations, two unknowns, um, where the unknowns are beta and theta and you could solve this. However, we weren't looking in particular any data. So to look at this um, numerically, just to uh, simulate for some uh, beta hat and gamma not hats, which we don't know, um, we just fixed beta hat and then estimated gamma not hat as, a, as the variance, stationary variance of an AR1 process. Um, and to note that these two um, equations actually have analytical solutions, but they're uh, very, complicated to write down it. Um, there's lots of uh, terms going on there and square roots and things, so it's a bit ugly to look at. Um, okay, so anyway, to, uh, I'm now gonna look at the numerical results for this. So 
fixing beta hat and estimating gamma not hat as from this. Um, and also with sigma squared equal to one, set sigma squared equal to one. So to do this, I'm, um, we minimize this uh, cost function. Um, so essentially when this is min at the minimum point, you would expect the beta hat to be closest to the, the IGE representation and the gamma not hat to be closest to the variance of logs representation in beta and theta. And I set the parameters for beta to be between zero and one and theta to between uh, minus one and one. And um, yeah, so then you solve this numerically and uh, it gave the following results. Um, so the left graph, uh, you can see beta going from I think 0.1 to about 0.9 and the theta on the y, um, which are all roughly zero. Um, so that's the result you get. So it seems like the beta roughly tracks the beta hat and the theta is roughly uh, zero, although there's potentially an interesting sign change going on there. Um, and you can see that the cost function, so how well it works, essentially this optimization, uh, it seems to work steadily better from low beta to around 0.8 and goes up slightly. Um, so, so yeah, this is essentially fine, assuming AR1, but then assuming the Solon model and finding the beta and theta. However, this was just an initial exploration and we haven't really found the like real world effects or what this means exactly. Like why should the beta be near beta hat? Why should the theta be almost insignificant? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So after these uh, influential analysis presented by Sam, I'd like to talk about few qualitative results that emerged out of our study. So here I have formula of variance as function of beta and theta. For time being, we have fixed sigma square as well. First thing that we notice is asymptotic behavior of variance where either theta or beta tend towards plus or minus one. This is so because if it is plus or minus one, we have a strong direct relationship between children and parents, wealth and genetic pattern, which creates a strict immobility across generations and which restrains the possibility of equality. The second thing that we observe is a perfect symmetry between beta and theta, which implies be it conscious investment choices made by parents in human and non-human capital of children, or be it unconscious inheritance in form of genetic traits or social prestige, both of them hold equal footing in determining the eventual income of their children. Third point is inequality. For appreciable range of beta and theta going from zero to one, where one means direct relation and zero means no link whatsoever, the highest inequality is observed for higher values of beta and theta. And the lowest inequality point is observed for theta equals to zero and beta equals to zero. Ideally, we would, to counter the positive stimulus of income by parents, we desire a negative draw on genes to counter the effect and, and gain maximum equality. But in real world, we know there's a positive transmission of wealth and genes. So in that case, theta equals to zero and beta equals to zero gives lowest inequality and highest equality. In next slide, this is the graphical representation of points that I made above. So in the left plot, we have plotted variance as function of theta going from minus one to one. For various positive constant beta, we, we observe their uh, minimum point in the negative space of theta almost roughly equals to minus beta. In the right plot, we have plotted theta for only practically appreciable range going from zero to one. And here we can see minima is lying around zero. And for higher beta, we observe higher variance. Second point that we see, Sam, could we? Yeah. Thank you. 
uh, the second result that we see is negative grandparental coefficient relating between grandparents income and children income for first order income model and first order genetic model it might seem paradoxical in first glance that richer grandparents will lead to poorer children but we miss out a subtle implication in framing this equation it says that there is a negative impact given that all other factors remain constant which also include parents income so despite an increase in grandparents income if parents couldn't increase their income it signals that maybe they received a poor genetic transmission which was also received by their children and hence the overall impact of grandparents is negative on their children however time and again our studies have shown a positive coefficient for grandparents and children which is minus beta theta so does that mean this analysis is wrong not wrong but i'd say incomplete what if the genetic endowment is not as simple as a sim uh, ar1 model we tried in fact we observed a higher order endowment model in genetic in genetic transmission so we have also considered a factor by grandparents gene as a direct addition to children's gene in this case we observe an ar3 model for log income now the now the sign of grandparental coefficient is positive but we observe a new factor a negative even smaller factor for great grandparental coefficient we can extend this to p order p order ar model in genetic transmission and we would always receive this last ancestral coefficient to be negative we, we so in, with advent of data if we consistent consistently get a positive coefficient for grandparents it does mean that they have a direct role in genetic transmission to their children it still that we are still we still don't uh, have gone through all the possibilities of reasons why we might receive a positive grandparental coefficient in measurement it might be because of group effects various ethnic groups leads to different intercepts in our equation which leads to omission of fixed effect and bias analyses have shown that it gives a positive push to all the to all the coefficients of all the generations it might also be due to measurement error where fitting a regression model on our data gives positive coefficients for all the generations it leads me to my final and concluding slide so overall our work we were in our work we were able to show the relationship between equality and mobility higher values of beta implies lower mobility which is reflected in society as higher inequality now we might now we one might ask why is it important to ask this question why is it important to pursue this research it is crucial because it puts us in the center of debate of process policies versus outcome policies to outline the contour of this debate i'd like to talk few minutes about process policies and outcome policies so outcome policies aim to manipulate the levers of government that is subsidy tax regulations and expenditures to achieve a final certain outcome for example direct cash transfers to keep children in school the success of these policies is measured by to what extent these transfer encourage people to satisfy that particular condition process policies on the other hand try to shift the trajectory of change for example giving political reservations to certain class of people in these cases the proximate impact is too subtle to notice but they are longer lasting in this case we try to change the power dynamic of people by shifting the process of decision making in favor of lesser privilege so coming back to the wealth part of this debate outcome based approach argues that a uh, maximizing economic growth would allow all the individuals to benefit from this and create a more equal society so we should only investigate more deeply about final wealth distributions and variance of log and similar representations policy process on the other hand recognize the importance of opportunity and constraints on choices and hence solicit affirmative action on betas and thetas of the world so overall this work provides as provided as a space to rethink the diagnosis of inequality to present the case for both process policies and outcome policies and how to include them in mainstream
which brings me to my final point to to reinforce any theory we must make our ideas legitimate by methods of measurement and statistics we still have a lot of diligent work to do to test our theory against data given that the variables of this model for our social influence wealth or genetic inheritances are noisy indicators themselves it is difficult to quantify them and even more difficult to track them over a time spanning several generations but we hope that with more data collection and data analysis with refined data our understanding will be better and improve and we'll be able to find a to find a, a more solid a solid model of multi generational wealth distribution with this we we'll end our slide we we'll end our presentation and we'll be happy to receive your views or questions so thank you very much, uh, Sam and, uh, and Critica, for this very nice, uh, very neat presentation. I, I would like to actually well, uh, 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 congratulate you for this uh, very nice presentation uh, project to you and also to your supervisors. Uh, colleagues, there are time, time for questions. Actually, I think we have uh, like uh, seven minutes for questions. So if any of us have some questions, so, so please uh, unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask that directly. Um, I think Reiner may have had his hand raised. I don't know if that's true, but I, I have a question, so I will I will just go, ask it. Yeah, go, go yeah. ahead, but let me, let me point out a couple of things. Uh, I, I'm trying to control the whole thing with a desktop and a laptop. If somebody raises a hand with a video, I cannot see it, okay? So so maybe do it uh, do it with the, with the icon or just simply admit your microphone and ask directly. So uh, Alex, please go ahead. Yeah, so I was just wondering, I, I think this is, this potentially this, this negative coefficient of um, grandparent and great grandparental log incomes is, is sort of curious and counterintuitive at, at first glance. I was just wondering if you just look at the unconditional correlation say between um, child and grandparent log incomes, presumably you find that to be positive. And actually, this is really just a, if you like, a correction term, because the effect of the grandparental log income is maybe overstated in the parental log income. Is that, does that sound right or have I got that wrong? Um, yeah, I would say, so yeah, I think I did look at the auto correlation of lag two. And I think, yeah, for the betas and thetas, positive I think it is positive yeah um yeah so yeah you're right about that I I think it was just the interesting point where you go from you always seem to get this factor come out so uh when you increase the endowment then you get the negative in the then the great grandparent whereas the grandparent can then be positive so I don't know it's like an interesting effect but I, yeah, maybe the autocorrelations are still positive. So in effect, it doesn't, there's still a pro positive transmission, even though you see a negative effect. Um, but it's just interesting, you always get this negative factor at the last generation when you, when you increase the, the lag of the uh, Ypsilon T. Um, Thanks. I mean, I would need to think about it a lot more, but my guess is yeah. it's really just reflecting the fact that this is an autoregressive process yeah. and, that, and that this is basically a correction because you've already got contributions within the, the lower order terms. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So it's, it is an interesting point. Thank you for yeah. your answer. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Sam, for, for the answer. Uh, more questions, colleagues? Please uh, directly unmute your microphone and go ahead. Or, or write it in the chat if you have, you have some technical problems so I can read it. Okay, so if not, shall we thank uh, Sam, uh, Critica, and the supervisors for this fantastic uh, presentation and, and project. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, very well, so let me...